So I'm here with someone you may have heard of, uh, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And this is the first time we've really sat down together since we spent the day together back mm -hmm. in like late March mm -hmm. of last year. So some things have changed. I Just don't know. Just a few. Just a few. <laughs> so you've kind of become this undisputed leader of the progressive movement and Fox News' everyday topic. How do you feel about that just from a human perspective? How have you adjusted? I'm As someone who yeah. knows you a little, I just want to hear how you're doing. Thanks. No, I appreciate you asking. And yeah, I mean, the last time we had this interview, we were just walking around Park Chester in the Bronx and just yeah. talking about this impossible race that I somehow thought I was going to be able to win. And and that our audience, you know, really saw the the value of. And I think, you know, I'm I'm doing great now, but that transition was it's surreal. It's not something that any human or I think our psychology is even prepared to handle. So after the win, just like the immediate attention, especially because very few outlets, you know, TYT was the first kind of outlet on the scene with our campaign. But um, aside from you guys, there were only a handful that paid attention in any way to our race. And so because of that, the crush of attention afterwards was everyone trying to catch up to the year's worth of reporting that you all had already been doing, frankly. Um, so it was intense, but you know, it's weird to call it normal because it's not normal, but I think I'm adjusting to, you know, Tucker Carlson being obsessed with me and all of these, all of these weird trimmings that come with the situation. Yeah, it's it's really unreal. Um, and beyond just the superficial attention aspect, mm -hmm. which it's great that you've gotten used to it, you've had a lot of accomplishments, especially getting the Green New Deal into basically every Democratic presidential candidate's platform. You've gotten a variety of co-sponsors in the House. The Senate has taken it up as well. That's just my one that sticks out to me. But mm -hmm. what are the progressive accomplishments in the past year uh, from your yeah. end that stick out to you. I mean, and it's not even the past year because we're just this week officially marking six months. Right, into you've, my term. you've only been in Congress I'm, for a few months. Right, exactly. <laughs> so it seems crazy. I've only been in Congress for six months. Yeah. And so, um, so it, but it's been a really productive six months, especially considering that uh, we got sworn in during the longest government shutdown in history. So, um, that first month it was hard to move anything because the government wasn't open. So even beyond just being here six months, it's really been like four or five months. Right. Um, but we've been able to do a lot. And I always want to reiterate that it's not me that's doing this. It's the progressive movement. It's activists. It's people that are tuned in, that are paying attention, that are rallying support around these things. So some of those things, for example, is um, we just got, along with Ro Khanna, we held this hearing on how military contractors were price gouging uh, the government, insane amounts on tiny little parts. So it amounted to just millions and billions of dollars potentially of waste. And so we held a hearing on one bad actor in particular, a military contractor named Transdime. And, um, we we showed the public what they were doing and we got a 16 million dollar refund from that military contractor alone um, so in small ways you know when we think about what those resources can be used for it adds up to the argument of when people say well we can't pay for medicare for all or tuition free public college we show we're showing the waste and showing that it's possible that that argument doesn't really have a leg to stand on um, so there's that um, I mean, there's so much. We were able to start building the case with Michael Cohen to subpoena the president's uh, to subpoena the president for his tax returns. We're able to get the Green New Deal in the national conversation. We're able to move the presidential field to the left. Um, so there's a lot of wins, from small wins to to big ones. Yeah. So. Speaking of the presidential field, mm -hmm. I'm going to put my mainstream media hat on for a second. <laughs> I know you're not going to endorse right now and you're holding off, but what yeah. kind of presidential candidate would you want to endorse? What kind of values, mm -hmm. what kind of policy positions would be in the forefront of your mind? Listen, I think we need a progressive president. I think a progressive president can A, beat Trump, 
as much as people think that that's not possible, I think it's the only way, though I really believe the only way that we're going to be able to beat this president is with a progressive candidate. So we need candidates that are committed to Medicare for all, to tuition-free public colleges and universities. We need a candidate that is dedicated to passing at least a $15 minimum wage, ideally one that's pegged to inflation. Uh, we need, I mean, there's so much that that we need in a progressive candidate, and we need one that isn't bought by corporations. I mean, I think that's the huge thing. We need one that isn't beholden to Wall Street. And, um, and that, to me, narrows the field significantly from the 20-odd people <laughs> that are in there right now. Um, it's no secret that, that I kind of called for eliminations <laughs> last week. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, that's how you defined progressive. That's how I would define progressive. But then Joe Biden goes, I'm the most progressive candidate in the race. I have the most progressive record. It's just patently untrue. Right, yeah. right. And I think record is important um, because it shows a consistency in values and beliefs. But the term progressive is getting hijacked so much that people just think it means Democrat now. And not all Democrats are progressive. And I'm sorry, but if you're going to come out and saying that you, you support the Hyde Amendment, which prevents us from funding clinics like Planned Parenthood, that's not progressive. Yeah. That's not a progressive position. And you know what? If your pride is being a moderate centrist candidate, then go out and say that. Say, I'm proud to be a centrist. I'm proud to be funded by Wall Street. I'm proud to not push as hard as I can on women's rights. Um, say it, own it, be it. But don't kind of come out here and then say you're a progressive candidate, but at the same time um, not support repealing something as basic as the Hyde Amendment. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much dishonesty when it comes to the label, and that's what's frustrating for actual yeah. people who put in the grunt work like yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Of the legislative end. Um, so turning my focus to Congress or our focus to Congress, the DCCC has given you hell, basically, and they supported this boycott mm -hmm. um, or this blacklist mm -hmm. of any contractors who are going to be working uh, with people who are primarying Democrats, no matter how far right they are. Right. Uh, it's, I think, incredibly harmful to the party and to democracy because you're essentially blocking off all of these consulting firms mm -hmm. um, from working with anyone like yourself. And Justice Democrats today just endorsed the original seven or the key seven, including you. Um, so there's this really this divide between the Justice Democrats mm -hmm. kind of wing and what the DCCC and the pressure they're trying to exert uh, is. So will you be endorsing primary challengers uh, come closer to 2020? Yeah, I think so. Um, and the thing is, though, so much of it depends on three things, because I also think it's important that I say that it's not about endorsing a, challenge, a primary challenger just for the sake of endorsing a primary challenger. Right. This is not, a, you know, what we have a mission. Our, our mission is not to boot everyone out of Congress. Our mission is to get a progressive agenda passed and to have our party represent people again, you know, be most accountable to people more than we are to corporations or private interests. And so for me, it, it always comes down to the race, right? It's about the community that's being represented, the district. It's about the incumbent and it's about the challenger. And to me, those things really need to triangulate into a great uh, combination to be worth endorsing. You know, this isn't about we're just going to endorse everyone for everyone's sake. Um, we need to have really strong candidates that can that can r have the executive function as well to run a campaign right like you need to you need to not only be endorsing the positions but running a campaign is really hard and you need to be able to execute you need to be committed to those doors to the knocking to the phone operations you have to be organizers in addition to to just being progressive on the issues so you need a candidate like that you need an incumbent that's not doing their job which they exist. They're out there. They are. And They're you, your colleagues. That's and right. That's controversial to say, but you know probably better than anyone. Yeah, I mean, I replaced one. Yeah. And so I can't pretend that I can't pretend that I didn't get here the way that I got here. You can't do party unity for the sake of party unity. Right. Because party unity shouldn't mean stop 
pushing where we can push. Um, and then the third thing is that we need a district that's going to be able to carry that person in, into office. Yeah. So speaking of party unity, mm -hmm. you're working with someone really far on the right in the Senate, in Ted Cruz, uh, on this legislation that would ban more former members of Congress from becoming lobbyists, which I think is a huge step in the right direction mm -hmm. for anti-corruption and combating big money interests, which you, you're so focused on. Um, He's a really right, huge right winger. I'm super shocked that he decided mm -hmm. to work with you. Can you talk about what that's been like and if, if he's actually moving along in that process yeah. or just tweeting at you for attention? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, it's it, our, our legislative teams are meeting. So we're going to see yeah. how far we can push this. Uh, the real key here, though, is in the loopholes. So one of the things that a lot of people don't know, and this is something that I kind of discovered when we started digging into this, is that it's not about banning members of Congress from becoming registered lobbyists just as a straight rule, because there are so many dark money loopholes where, okay, you're not a registered lobbyist, but you can go work for a lobbying firm and consult the firm, and that gets you out of actually being a registered lobbyist, but you're still essentially lobbying. Right. And so uh, what we found was last year, you know, this whole conversation started by finding out that the vast majority of members that left their seats last year have gone on to lobbying. And but what we found is that out of all of those members, only two are actual registered lobbyists. So the real question here that um, we're trying to kind of figure out in in this collaboration is how far he's willing to go. Is this just about the letter of the law, or is he serious about really banning lobbying in spirit? And so I'm um, I'm really looking forward to seeing where and how far they'd be willing to move on that. But I'm encouraged. And actually, Chip Roy, who's in Congress, he represents like kind of the Austin area. Um, he's a member of Congress. He's on the Republican side. He used to be Ted Cruz's chief of staff, I believe. He used to be a staffer for Ted Cruz. Now he's in Congress and he reached out, out to us as well. So, you know, I think there's some wiggle room here. It's super bizarre, really weird. Never thought in my <laughs> life that one of my first pushes would be alongside Ted Cruz. Right. But um, I, I think it really shows what the true spirit of not being partisan is and that bipartisanship doesn't mean let's come together to go to war and lower taxes on the rich. But bipartisanship means, OK, I will swallow all of my distaste <laughs> in this situation because we have found a common interest. And common cause, I think, can transcend bipartisanship. Um, and I think that's the way that we should go. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, it's absolutely. So great to see you again. Of course. And, and uh, yeah. I'll be seeing you soon. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm really excited. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> thanks.